This is the second part of a talk on London transport poster art and its promotion of London with me, Matt Brosnan, head curator at London Transport Museum. The onset of the Second World War effectively halted London Transport's publicity work. It also saw the departure of London Transport's chief executive, Frank Pick, who left to join the Ministry of Information in 1940. He died shortly after, aged 62, in 1941, having exerted an influence on London Transport that is still apparent today, particularly in its branding and style ethos. Posters, reduced in size and quantity because of wartime paper shortages, took on a role of boosting morale both for passengers and staff during the Blitz and beyond, as shown in this Walter Spradbury design. They also emphasised the role of the company in keeping London moving, particularly the increased role of women in London transport, typified by this Eric Kennington poster. After the war, London transport was carrying more passengers than ever before and no longer needed to encourage greater use of the system. However, the pic tradition of pictorial posters was revived by the new publicity officer, Harold Hutchison. His main innovation was the pair poster, where one poster was devoted entirely to artwork and the second alongside carrying text for information with a linked visual element. This allowed the artist greater freedom of expression as well as providing London transport copywriters more space to expand on the topic. The idea was to attract the viewer with large uncluttered artwork and then offer extensive information for anyone waiting for a bus or train. As in the interwar years, both the established artists and new designers were commissioned. This pair poster by Edward Borden was one of several he completed for London Transport, being first commissioned in the 1920s. By contrast, the artist John Minton, a well-known artist and book illustrator in the 1940s and 1950s, only ever completed one design for London Transport, shown here. While compared to the golden age of the 1920s and 30s, the posters issued in the post-war years seem a little more limited in range, they continue to feature the work of influential graphic designers and artists. Some of these had long-standing relationships with London Transport, producing posters for the company over several decades. Tom Eckersley began designing London Transport posters in the 1930s, initially in collaboration with fellow artist Eric Lombers, as seen here in the left-hand poster. He continued to work with London Transport, marking his 50 years of design work with them in 1985. Eckersley's work featured distinctive and bold use of flat colour, sometimes using coloured paper cutouts to produce images still echoing Frank Pick's principles of legibility and clear messaging, as particularly shown in this 1976 example. Abram Games was another giant of mid-20th century poster design with an instantly recognisable style. He was one of the most prominent poster designers in Britain during the Second World War and continued to work with a range of clients in the decades afterwards. These examples, ranging from an immediately post-war example to his last poster for London Transport in 1976, show his characteristically bold use of colour and form to create, by the words of his own motto, maximum meaning, minimum means. Again, this is something Frank Pick would have wholeheartedly agreed with. A friend and contemporary of Abram Games was the designer Hans Unger, who produced over 100 designs for London Transport between 1950 and his death in 1975. Unger was one of a number of émigré designers who fled Nazi-threatened Europe in the 1930s and went on to be commissioned by London Transport, in his case arriving in London in 1948 after a period in South Africa. Unger was another who forged a highly distinctive style, particularly in his collaborations with mosaic artist Eberhard Schulze and his own development of these skills. Several of his London transport posters are two-dimensional representations of 3D artworks incorporating mosaic or occasionally object-based elements. However, alongside this continued interesting poster work came the arrival of television advertising and new colour magazines as promotional media began to erode the dominant role of the poster as a publicity tool. Alongside this, in the 1960s and 1970s, London Transport battled with a succession of problems including financial difficulties, staff shortages, service unreliability and a decline in passenger numbers. Art poster publicity came to be regarded as more of a luxury that the organisation could not particularly afford. 
In the 1920s, the underground had issued a new design almost every week. By the late 1970s, this had fallen to only a relative handful of direct commissions to artists each year. Instead, most London transport advertising work was now contracted out to agencies who often tended to use photographic images rather than artwork for posters. These two examples from the late 1970s and 80s typify this approach, both incorporating photography with messaging emphasising the direct tube links to Heathrow Airport and the tube's reliability in congested surface level central London. While they may have been effective in their own way, I think you'll agree they are infinitely duller than most of the 1920s, 30s and 40s examples I've shown you so far. In the 1980s, London Underground again commissioned half a dozen new works of art each year and reproduced them as posters, partially reviving the sense of London transport being a patron of poster art. As in the past, these commissions have included well-known artists, such as Julian Trevelyan and Howard Hodgkin seen here, as well as up-and-coming artists. With passenger numbers on the increase, London Underground did not have an essential need to use posters to encourage travel. Instead, the new campaign was essentially a programme of fine art sponsorship that commissioned and used art for art's sake. While the posters are perhaps not a purist vision of what poster art was in its golden age heyday, where the best examples incorporated visual and graphic art in one cohesive design, they have been part of again associating art with London Transport's corporate identity. While these two examples depicting Kew Gardens hark back to the interwar approach of focusing on destinations, their focus is on being appreciated as works of art rather than as a marketing tool. While the method is different, the ultimate intention has similarities to Frank Pick's approach nearly a century ago. At the turn of the millennium, London Underground continued the use of art it had reignited in the 1980s under the title Platform for Art, which was then renamed Art on the Underground in 2007. This programme continues to commission contemporary artworks for display on the network, also involving artwork on pocket maps and sometimes posters. These examples by artists David Shrigley and Mark Wallinger both play with the iconic tube map. This has again reinforced the link between London Underground and art for the wider benefit of people experiencing the network rather than for specific commercial or advertising reasons. Taken as a whole, the London Transport Museum poster collection is a wonderful visual representation of how one major transport system has attempted to publicise itself and promote London as a city for well over a hundred years. As these examples by Clive Gardner and Ruth Hyde's show, the history and beauty of the city itself is at the heart of many of these designs, despite these posters being produced in different centuries. Posters continue to be at the heart of our collection and one that we intend to display regularly at our museum in Covent Garden. You can also explore this collection through our website. Thanks for listening.